So, uh, hello everyone and thank you for coming uh, to our talk. We will talk about detracing Postgres and tracing the madness of uh, gin index pending list uh, flushes that we found in production. We have a case study and we hope you will all uh, like our findings and see how great detrace is at actually uh, diagnosing problems uh, in production without altering production code or your deployment. So my name is Adam Volk. Uh, I am an unopened BSD developer and a software developer at Fudo Security. Uh, I have a da database background. I worked uh, for seven years with Oracle databases, unfortunately. Uh, and after that, spent four years with Postgres and now I'm working at Fudo Security where I I'm mostly doing uh, backend C stuff and taking care of the database. Unfortunately, we have only one mic, so sorry for that, but we will pass uh, the mic like three times, so. Uh, hope you, you will bear with us. So my name is Mariusz Zaborski. I'm also working at Fudo Security. I'm a manager and software developer there. I'm also a FreeBSD, FreeBSD committer. Uh, together with Adam, we also run a BSD user group if you are interested into. And sometimes I'm blog posting some interesting stuff about FreeBSD and uh, computer science in general. So if you, if you are interested, you can look into that blog as well. So, uh, First, I will describe you a little bit what is Dtrace, what we can really do with that. But does anyone ever use Dtrace before? Like, okay, good. But most of you didn't, so uh, hope the users uh, uh, the users will bear with me, and uh, most uh, most of the people can can learn some new stuff about Dtrace. So Dtrace is a dy dynamic tracing uh, framework. Um, we can trace our program without recompiling it, without uh, adding any additional probes. We can just trace it. We can uh, add probes in places whenever we want. We can see in a moment where we can, uh, which uh, things we can really trace. Um, the, we program uh, Dtrace in, uh, using Descript, which is very simple language. It's a subset of C language. Some people say that it's inspired by Oak as well, so the um, so the uh, languages are quite uh, similar. And the subset is uh, designed that you cannot hurt yourself. So, for example, you will not find loops in Dtrace because when you have a loop, you probably can uh, loop your kernel and never uh, never uh, end the loop. So, things like loops are not allowed in kernel. Uh, when we have uh, Dtrace uh, in our operating system, it, uh, there is no performance penalty. It's just there. It doesn't run. It doesn't hurt us. If we will enable Dtrace, it will only um, there will be some penalty performance. Uh, for our application, not for whole system, and only for things that we really tracing. So only in the places where the probes are uh, are set. So what we can uh, trace with uh, with Dtrace, we can uh, create our probes on the um, wh which function we are uh, calling, which arguments of function was passed to the to the uh, to the uh, function, uh, how frequently the calls was done, and um, we can also uh, trace uh, the return calls or the function of the syscalls. And also, which is uh, very useful, we can uh, track whole uh, function call stack. So we can see exactly what was the path where we are right now. And much more, but we will focus on those, those few things. So a little bit about semantics. Probe is something that we tracing. This is something that, that we want to see. Um, probe is built from provider. Provider is some uh, Dtrace module, so we can, for example, have a syscall module, which will inform us about the syscall in the, our operating system. We have a PID um, module, which is a PID provider, which informs us about our uh, processes. Uh, we have a VFS, which is uh, for, uh, for file system, and so on and so on. 
some of the providers must be built into the operating system. So we, you will see that not all providers are exactly the same on all operating systems. So some Solaris, uh, some, uh, Solaris can have some other providers than FreeBSD and, and Linux. So this is something that you need to be aware. So module is basically a software module. It can be a libc, it can be a Postgres, uh, it can be just a kernel. So this is uh, just a module that we're working on. Then this is a function which uh, basically is the function that we want to trace. So we can trace, uh, for example, syscall open or, or some other function in, in dtrace. Uh, then we have uh, some predicted. So this is, uh, we can say when the probe should be, uh, should be uh, fired. So what conditions should be, um, uh, what conditions should be uh, done to, to be able to, to uh, mm, trigger the, the probe. And then we have action, which is basically some, some descript, what we want to do with our, our information that we are gathering. So here we have uh, some example of, of uh, D-trace uh, probes. So, uh, oh, so here we have a provider, which is Cisco. Then we have module, which we don't care, so we just leave it. We don't need to provide it. Then we have a function, write, and on the entry. So this probe will be fired every time when the syscall write will be uh, executed. And here we have another example with the probe also syscall, with the write function, with write syscall. Uh, the probe is set on return, so every time when, the, uh, when we are returning from the, from the probe, it will be fired. And we also have some predicted. So arc1 is basically the uh, return value from syscall. So every time when we write more than 10 uh, bytes, we will uh, fire this, this probe. So in FreeBSD, I'm a FreeBSD guy, so you, you need to bear with me. I will talk a little bit about FreeBSD. With uh, over 15,000 uh, probes, we can very easily uh, list the probes using dtrace minus all. So if your uh, operating system support uh, FreeBSD, uh, support dtrace, you can list all the props with the providers, with the module, with the function, with the, uh, with the uh, name of it. Uh, we can also um, filter a little bit our, of our uh, search. So for example, if you are looking only for, for a provider with Cisco, we also can do that with, uh, with dtrace. So here, of course, this is truncated. We have a, a list of all the Cisco's that are enabled in, in FreeBSD with the provider Cisco. We can also be uh, more uh, precise. We can ask uh, what the probe really is. So here is a D-trace uh, with the flags that will provide us this description. This is also truncated, but uh, we will have, of course, a provider, module, function, and name, but also some small uh, description what this, uh, what this probe is. But what is also very important, what is very useful, we also will get the information what arguments are passed to the function. So if we, for example, have uh, entry, then argument zero will be in. That, that's, that's true because read is, uh, the first argument of read is the file descriptor that we want to read from. So uh, they will, this will be the, the file descriptor. So uh, let's do some tracing on the very simple simple program with some, a few examples. So uh, we have a very simple program with main, which is basically is uh, rand, uh, randomize some number. If it's uh, the number is odd, then we execute full, a full function. If the uh, number is even, we execute bar function. So what we can do with dtrace? We can basically set a dtrace um, probe for function entry that we're interested. So we just uh, skip the module, we skip the function, we will get all the uh, function entries in our, uh, in our uh, script. Uh, so every time when run is run, we will get the information about that, then foo is run again, and, and so on, and so on. And uh, this also is truncated because, of course, uh, we start with the main function and so on, but this is not important. So we can also count the, uh, how many times the function was called. So we can basically pass the uh, prof function, so uh, the uh, name of the function that we are, uh, we are interested into, to the aggregation function. So we are counting 
how many times that the function was executed. So here we see that foo was executed so many times, bar was executed so many times, and so on and so on. Um, so like I mentioned, we can also track the user stack. So we can also aggregate how many uh, times the path was taken. So we pass to our aggregation uh, function the uh, use stack function, which is the uh, which prints our current current stack, and we basically count the how many times the stack was taken. Uh, of course, uh, I, I didn't mention that, but it's very useful to have a binary which isn't stripped. That means that we have some symbols in our binary, so we are able to. Uh, see the, the names of the function. Here, for example, the one of the function was stripped, so we don't see the, the name of the function, we just see the address of the function. Of course, if the, if the stack would be greater, then we would see whole whole stack of the function which was called. So, the one of the most powerful things in, in tracing is generating uh, flame graphs. Here we have an example of flame graph. This is basically a, a visualization of, of uh, stack of the user stack or kernel stack. Here we have a visualization of the Postgres. Um, uh, Postgres. So we can basically see how long uh, the, uh, our process was spending time in which function. So for example, we have to tie standard executor run, so, uh, which is a Postgres function. Uh, which we see that all the time was spent in this uh, in this function, but we also see this smaller uh, smaller functions like parse text and how much the, the function uh, how much our Postgres spent the, uh, time in this function. So uh, this allows us to profile our application, see where are we, where we are lacking the performance. Uh, Flamegrass was. Uh, Maybe not designed, but was mostly populated by, by Brand Greg. This is a guy who, who is the, the guy of the tracing. Uh, so he prepared a very uh, simple two scripts, which you can run on your dtrace output and generate the, the, the flame grass. To be fair, flame graphs are not dedicated to, to dtrace. You can also generate flame graphs from, from perf or whatever uh, tracing tool you are using, but it's very simple to do it with the, uh, with the D-trace. Uh, fair warning, you need to remember to adjust uh, stack frames, which is a um, variable for uh, how many, um, how many uh, functions should be reported when we call stack functions, so the stack for the kernel, or U-stack and J-stack if you are tracing the, uh, the, um, uh, the users, uh, user programs. Because otherwise you can get something like that, which looks like a flame graph, but it's a little bit broken flame graph because uh, the stack was truncated at some point, and you can see that uh, this functions this, this function call is basically the same like this. We have a, a postmaster main, and here we have postmaster main, close postmaster ports, close postmaster call, but the output of our uh, stack was truncated, so. Uh, there was enough information, so uh, the script generating the flame graph was thinking that this is basically the separate uh, call of the functions, the separate uh, information. So please remember about adjusting the, uh, those, those values. So uh, what is also very interesting, we can even, uh, uh, we can even cast our uh, memory to, to structures, so we are able to read some uh, variables from structure if you want to. So here we have uh, some, some structure, we, we assign some, some function, uh, some, some uh, values to, the, to, the, uh, to this structure, and we call foo function. So we create a, a uh, prop on the foo entry, uh, so we copy the memory from arg0, which is our structure, we cast it to the test function, and we print the values like normal in C. What is the, the most interesting thing, we basically ca can do the preprocessing, so we basically just include our header that we want to. So we don't need to do some fancy things and copy paste, tra uh, translate it to the gtrace struct or whatever, we can just include the header. Uh, so where can I use it? Of course, you can use it on FreeBSD. You can use it on macOS. You can kind of use it on NetBSD. We heard that there are some problems, so maybe we don't recommend that, but you can. Uh, I didn't mention that, but Dtrace was originally designed in Stan Microsystem. So of course, you can use it on uh, Solaris. Uh, there are also some uh, 
work on, on porting D-Trace to Linux. Uh, we didn't test it, so we cannot really recommend that. But what is the most interesting thing, uh, maybe you will, you will be able to use D-Trace on Windows. There are some work from Microsoft to port D-Trace to Windows. So if this would be happen, then you can use basically D-Trace on every modern operating system. So what about the D-Trace and Postgres? Between D-Trace and Postgres, there is some kind of love because we, you already have a lot of probes in, in D-Trace. Uh, unfortunately, uh, to be able to use uh, those probes, you need to compile the D-Trace with the enabled D-Trace flag, which nobody used. And in our scenario, we also didn't have this flag compiled in, so we wasn't able to use it. So this is something that I would like to mention, that you already have some, some probes, for example, for tra transaction start, for transaction commit, but uh, in this talk, we will not focus on, on those uh, probes because we didn't have it, so you probably will also don't have it because you will not build D-Trace with, with this support. Uh, so here is some example how you can use it. Basically, we are, we are counting how many uh, transactions was aborted in, in during the uh, tracing of, of Postgres. So now let's go a little bit into the madness and talk about Gene. Okay, and we are back. So uh, to understand why we even started with uh, D-Trace, we have to uh, know the use case uh, and what trouble we had. So um, we observed in production a hanging insert. It was like take something that usually took a second, started taking 30 minutes, like really minutes. And uh, there was nothing in the operating system indicating uh, what, would, what could be the cause of uh, that behavior. So uh, I started to take a look and made some guesses. And uh, I thought that the most likely cause was, uh, was the gene pending list being uh, merged with the main B tree of the index. But I had no real way of confirming that. And we, we will show you how you can do that with D-Trace. But to start, we'll go over a bit of what gene indexes are and what the pending list is. Uh, I think most people here know what a gene index is, but uh, we will still try to rush through it, and I hope I won't bore you or uh, you know, say something stupid. So what are uh, indexes of type gene? They are generalized inverted indexes. They are used mostly for full text search, but also for JSON and JSONB indexes. In our case, we use it for full text search. Uh, the index are items are composite values that, that contain zero or more keys, so like integer arrays, where the keys would be integers, or text, where the keys would be lexemes. And they are optimized for cases where many keys have the same values and they appear in many different items. So I shamelessly stolen this slide from PGConf EAU uh, 2012 uh, by Oleg Bartunov and Alexander Korotkov. Those are the, uh, I think you all know, but those are the main gene implementation authors. And uh, I really love this slide because it shows uh, very well how a gene index works. It's like uh, the index in at the back of your book that lists uh, all the words and all the pages those words appeared on. So for example, if you would like to find in a book what page talks about uh, accelerator com compensation, you would, uh, you would find, uh, is there a pointer here? Yeah, so you would look at acceler accelerometers, look at all the pages, look at compensation, look at all the pages, find the common page 30, so it's most likely that page 30 talks about accelerometer compensation. And that's how you do also full, full text search. And this slide is also great because it shows uh, the actual structure of the index. It doesn't show the meta page, and we will need to talk about the meta page because we will be accessing it. So the meta page uh, contains control information, the index version, and statistics, and points to the entry tree. Entry tree. 
And this is, uh, and that part of the structure is included on the slides. Uh, the entry tree is a B tree of uh, entries potentially containing a pending, a pending list, uh, a posting list, sorry. And that posting list since uh, Postgres uh, 9.3 can be compressed. And if there is no posting list, then it most likely it didn't fit along with the key. So instead there's a pointer to uh, a posting list uh, containing, uh, containing items. So uh, the pending list itself is attached to the meta page and it's a link in linked list of uh, pending key entries that were not yet merged with the main B tree. This is a performance optimization <coughs> to uh, allow for faster inserts. I will talk about that a bit uh, in a moment. And it's only there if the fast update option is enabled and it's enabled by default. So that's why it's important and that was my assumption. So before we did this talk, I ran a very uh, quick poll, uh, but that was back uh, a few months ago. So you, you're not, you weren't able to take part, but I'm very curious uh, how you all think. Uh, so the question is, there are like four parameters listed here. Work mem, maintenance work mem, gene pending list limit, out of vacuum work mem. And the question is, uh, which of those parameters has no direct impact on how much memory is used while the index, uh, while the pending list is merged back to the B tree. So uh, let's do a show. Of, uh, so again, uh, I want to make sure the, qu the question is understood. So which one won't cause more memory usage if I raise it when the list is being merged back? So uh, who thinks that work mem has no impact? Okay, so like one person. Maintenance work mem, no hands. Gene pending list limit, okay, one. Out of vacuum work mem, okay, so the, everyone thinks out of vacuum work mem has no impact. We will see in a moment. Okay, so why are we even holding a pending list? Because uh, Index uh, rebuilds are costly, and when you are insert inserting items into a pending list due to its structure, uh, for example, if you are indexing a sentence, it might touch a lot of uh, leaves of the tree. So you are potentially locking and changing uh, a, lot of, uh, a large part across the whole index, so that takes time. And, uh, in order to uh, optimize that, you can, you can hold a pending list, that's how actually what it's doing. It's a linked list of items that you will keep along the meta page. Instead of directly adding them to the index, you just hold it there. And when someone uh, tries to search inside the index, you first do a ON complexity scan of the list before going into the B tree. That's obviously okay as long as the list doesn't grow too big. So when uh, another thing that, uh, that's very important is that there's some predicate locking happening on with uh, a fast update on. Because we have a pending list, we actually don't know where in the index they will land. So we can't lock just a single part of the tree when an insert happens, we have to take a lock on the whole thing. So this uh, impacts potentially every query that makes a search will block the whole tree. Uh, so the, the cost of each query is increased because we are doing an ON scan of it. So we have to dump it before it grows too big. And where does this dumping, dumping happen? It happens during vacuum. Whenever we vacuum, uh, the depending list will be merged back with the B tree, regardless of its size. It can have one item and it, it will be merged back. And it can have 30 items and they will be merged back. It will happen with auto vacuum. It will, it will uh, what I found surprising, but it is documented. Uh, it will happen dur during auto vacuum analyze. So you might suddenly see that there's actually lots of action going around in the B tree because it's 
merging a pending list and you just uh, you are just thinking that it's analyzing data but it's doing much more right and uh, it won't be done on a direct direct analyze so you can't force it by doing analyze table or something like that it's only with out of vacuum analyze it also happens post insert and that was my guess that this is our production issue uh, and it happens post to in insert depending on your Postgres version and what happened. So it can happen uh, when it uh, gets over work memory, work mem setting, that's before Postgres 9.5. It can happen if it goes over the gene pending list limit, that, that's post uh, uh, 9.5. And it can happen when it's triggered by you by a function call. We can call a function gin clean pending list, and this will cause the pending list being merged back with the main B tree. So, uh, answering our question, uh, work mem, uh, so merging the, will use, uh, so the flushing will use at most. It will use at most working memory, so work mem, if the pending list flush, so gene insert cleanup, that's the function name from Postgres internals, happens post insert. So we are inserting just regular insert statements and uh, we uh, decided that it's time to flush. So we the, the code will use at, wo at most work mem of memory for flushing the whole, in, uh, whole list, even if it's larger than the work memory we have. If we are triggered from out of vacuum and the out of, out of vacuum work mem was set, we will use at most out of vacuum work mem memory. If we are triggered uh, by a gene clean pending list or triggered by out of vacuum and out of vacuum work mem is not, uh, is not set, we will use at most maintenance work mem. So when you are choosing a gene pending list limit, you have to know that it has absolutely no impact on how much memory will be used during the actual flushing. It only decides if the list is big enough that it, that it requires an immediate uh, flushing with the B tree right now during inserts. So yes, the gene pending list limit has no impact on memory use. So our test, uh, because uh, we wanted to reproduce the issue first before doing it on production and we wanted something easy uh, that all of you can try. Uh, I stole it from uh, an article linked at the end of the blog post uh, and at the end of the slides and we will uh, make the slides available so we will find the source, it will be properly credited. Uh, so we create a test table with just an ID and a TS vector text column we turn off out of vacuum. We turn it off because we want to exactly know where uh, our flushes happen. And without it, the Postgres might just dump the pending list without us noticing it. And we create a simple uh, gen index on the uh, text column. We insert some data. That's not really data for doing proper text search. We are just filling up the index. So we generate a lot of uh, MD5 checksums of some just plain text. And our configuration for those these slides here, because we were slightly derail derailed by checking fun stuff with Dtrace and Postgres, we were uh, tweaking work mem. Uh, we were uh, tweaking gene pending list limit. We did set max worker processes to one. We did that because we are lazy and didn't want to uh, you know, trace uh, what processes uh, Postgres spans. Uh, well, we did that, but it made the testing easier just not to, not to have to look those up. But it's not a requirement for Dtrace. You can have full parallelism uh, enabled in Postgres and trace everything, and that's not a problem. We were just lazy. Okay, so let's look inside. What can we do uh, in this specific case if we don't have uh, D-trace, right? What can we do without D-trace? If you are lucky enough to have uh, not an ancient Postgres like we did in that uh, use case, or lucky, lucky enough that you are allowed to uh, 
enable extensions on your production database, maybe you can't. Or if you are lucky enough that your feature, because you might have to use a different feature, has an extension written because it might not be there for a new feature, you can use, for example, Page Inspect and PGStat Tuple to diagnose this issue. So you could uh, check this test index and see um, uh, see the pending pages and pending tuples, so how large actually the, uh, the pending list is, right? <coughs> and by calling that constantly, you could observe it growing and going down, and you could make, gu make guesses or confi confirm your guesses that, yeah, it's likely rebuilding the pending list because that insert hanged for 30 minutes, and after those 30 minutes, the pending list shrank, okay? But in our case, we didn't have that option. And uh, it also has some drawbacks. So the extensions have drawbacks. They, they are a lot of code, right? Uh, they, are, they need to be loaded into the database. Uh, they don't answer the question of where exa when exactly that pending list cleanup, for, exa for example, was uh, triggered. We have to manually probe and sample the database to check uh, if that happened. And with Dtrace, you can get uh, like uh, a callback immediately when that actual code uh, gets executed. And those extensions might not be compatible with your version and uh, the feature might be too new, like I mentioned before. So going back to Marius. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so we wrote a very simple uh, D script. And so here we have a gene insert cleanup. This is a Postgres function responsible for uh, flashing the pending list. So when the flash will occur, we just uh, save our current timestamp. And when the gene insert cleanup will be finished on the return, we basically print the time, uh, the difference between the time. We did the same thing did for the executor run, which is a function in Dtrace to, uh, which is responsible for for executing our our SQL statement. So this is how the uh, output from Dtrace was looking like. We are seeing when exactly the flashing is uh, happening and what the time of the flash was. So we can see even that when we are inserting many data, the the the, the time is uh, has some uh, changes. And also we can see the whole time of the execution. All of those data are in nanoseconds. You can divide it or whatever in these tricks. So we did some testing. We uh, poke a little with the pending list uh, memory. So here is the uh, setting when pending list memory is uh, set to four megabytes and working memory is set to four megabytes. Uh, all those colors is when the, uh, when the flashing is happening. So. If we have many colors, that means that uh, many uh, flashing was happening and how long the flashing really takes. So this is our, our graph. So we can see that for pending list with a small, uh, small amount of memory and with small uh, working mem, we are flashing quite often. And with the time, the, the time is uh, increase, uh, starting to increase all the time with, with every, every next, uh, next flashing. So when we still had like uh, pending list set to four megabytes, but we increased the work mem, we can see that the, the, there was exactly the same amount of thing, but it was shorter. So did, uh, the, the Postgres did something that the real uh, flashing to the, to the tree was, was much shorter. And we also tried to poke a little with the pending list with very big, uh, uh, with big pending list, but small work mem. We had only three flashes. But the last one was very, very long. And if we change the pending list to very big, uh, to, to 32 megabytes and work mem to 64, we have a three uh, short, uh, short flashes. So theoretically, you would like to set a, a large uh, pending list and, and smart work mem, but uh, you need to remember that we are only inserting the data and we measure only inserts. So 
if you would like uh, to also measure the selects, uh, because uh, the, when the pending list was built, you, it wasn't flushed to the uh, to the tree. So every time when you are trying to select something, the Postgres need to go over the pending list and look the data uh, manually, so uh, linearly. So it it may be slow. So depending on your on your uh, settings, you can. Uh, poke a little bit with with those with those settings. Uh, so we was very interesting what what happens here. Basically, why this uh, this uh, pending list with uh, when the pending is very large, but work mem is small. Why why the the time here the the third flash was very very large. So we uh, decided to um, to generate a flame graph. So uh, what we did is uh, we just um, print the, use the, the amount of uh, user stacks and the amount of the kernel stacks. The profile 5000 uh, is a, a probe that allow you to uh, pick every uh, few hertz. So in this case, every 5000 hertz, we are picking our operating system, asking, hey, what, what is happening? And we if uh, it's working on our current process. He will just uh, print as the user stack of of our of our uh, of our process. So this is the graph that we get. Uh, we are the most interested in the function um, uh, in the standard executor run. So we just uh, sorry in the gene insert cleanup. So we can uh, truncate all of that. So this is a flame graph when the pending list is quite uh, quite large, 32 megabytes, and with the small <laughs> small work mem. And then this is a pending list uh, with our best uh, case scenario. So when the pending list is very large and work mem is really large. So we can see that the left side is, executes exactly the same functions. Uh, so. What is happening? Why, why here, uh, in, when the work mem is, is smaller, uh, why, why it spends less time in, the, in, this, uh, in this execution run? So the uh, pending page uh, function, which is a, a function used by insert BA entries, is responsible for uh, preparing our data, our pre uh, preparing our pending list uh, in, uh, to be flushed to the tree. Because we don't have really uh, work mem, we cannot uh, poke a lot of with the data. So we only we had only 600 samples in in this uh, in this um, uh, in this execution in this uh, in these functions. When we have a lot of work mem and pending list is quite big, then we can sp uh, poke a little bit with our data. We can prepare them to the, be inserted to to the tree. So we can. Uh, save time really inserting the data to the to the tree. So here, the, the right side of, of uh, uh, our flame graph is when the gene insert really happens, and this is basically the function uh, the function which is responsible for flashing all those uh, data to the to the tree. So as we can see uh, here. Basically, when we don't have work mem, our our uh, our Postgres cannot uh, prepare our data to be flushed. It's basically need to do it in smaller chunks more often. So uh, our case scenario was that we uh, we had some inserts to our database. It's hangouts. What is happening really in in our uh, in our Postgres? We don't know. We we would like to know what what is happening. So what we uh, so here is the the insert that we are doing. Adam is fan of uh, Tool. Uh, so what we really did is basically we, uh, we select from pgstat activity the actual uh, background process that is executing our our uh, our query, and uh, we uh, write a very simple again uh, D-trace script using already known for us a profile uh, uh, D probe, which was. Uh, which was uh, probing every uh, 99 hertz. And uh, this is very interesting. Why D-Trace is more powerful than, for example, uh, attaching GDB. In this case, we didn't modify, the, the, the uh, D-Trace didn't even modify the, uh, the uh, memory of Postgres or whatever. He only set a probe that every few seconds, every few nanoseconds, you should fire this and see what is happening in the kernel itself. If you are executing my program, just tell me what, what the stack trace of the program is. So if you would attach GDB to Postgres or try to use uh, other technique, 
it's basically uh, would somehow uh, needed to stop the Postgres, look how, how what is happening. Uh, maybe you will crash your Postgres. In that uh, case, we basically ask, asking kernel, when you will execute this, uh, this process, tell me what is happening there. So this is uh, the backtrace we do get, and w here we can find the gene insert cleanup, which was the function that was running on which uh, Postgres was, was working. This is not ideal, of course. You, you need to look then, when you got such, uh, um, uh, such stack, you need to look into the code, guess, uh, read a little bit code, understand what is happening, but it's better than nothing, right? So uh, what about the length of the pending list? So when we was preparing this uh, presentation and we saw those extensions, we, kinda, uh, we want to do the same, you know, with D-trace, and uh, it should be easy, right? Uh, to be fair, it was kind of kind of interesting, a little bit hackish, but I hope you, you will bear with me uh, how, how we was able to, to get the, the pending uh, list length. So in the Postgres, we have a structure called git meta page data, which has exactly the, the, the fields that we are interested in. So unpending pages and unpending heap tools are, are, the, uh, are those two values that describe how big our pending list is. So we went to the gene insert cleanup and we wanted to get the information uh, where the metadata is. So we look into the code and we see that there is a variable metadata and we wanted to get into it. But unfortunately, metadata is calculated by in page get uh, meta, which is a macro, so we cannot attach that because compiler just uh, did his thing, so, so we don't have access to it. It's using buffer get page, which I think also is macro, so we also cannot detach to the return value of this code. And it's using read buffer, so, so it's pretty, uh, pretty complicated to get the metadata of our, uh, of our function. So what we did is we decompiled the function. And we see that here is the invalid block number, which is basically a minus one. So we see that here is happening this comparison. And uh, R14D is, uh, is came from uh, this register, RIX. So we, that means that the, uh, that the structure is basically in, in this place. The, in, when, we, when we would hook here in the code, we would have exactly the pointer that we want to. So we did that. <laughs> we uh, implemented, uh, we write a small uh, D script, which is uh, hooking to the G insert cleanup. Here, we don't, uh, we don't hook up on the entry level. We hook up on the, uh, on the uh, offset of the uh, function that we really want to. We read the AIX register, or RIX, that doesn't matter anything. We copy the structure, and we print the, the pending pages uh, sizes. So it's doable. I don't think it uh, really changed anything. Uh, but you can see that D-Trace offers you a lot of more things. Like, you can really poke around your, your process and see what is happening. In that case, unfortunately, we need to go even much deeper to, to get the, uh, to get the uh, pending pages uh, sizes. But, but it was an interesting journey. So here are some useful materials. The, the presentation will be uh, shared, so you can uh, see them later. And thank you very much. And maybe there are some questions we would like to answer them.